Hello everyone and welcome back to Crossing Crafts. Today we'll be falling down a rabbit hole of imagination into the fantastical world of Studio Ghibli to craft my favorite scene from one of their most popular films. My Neighbor Totoro. To begin, we're gonna start with an armature for the base. The scene we're crafting is set inside of a tree, so we need our moss cavern to be up to building code so it doesn't cave in. I made some double wound wire to add extra strength to the structure, but I'm gonna need a longer one for the bottom, which will be a circle roughly the size of a circle. Now that we have a nice rotund piece of wire for the base, we can connect the four smaller pieces until we have made the world's least secure birdcage. But those metaphorical birds won't be able to escape for too long because we're gonna cover the whole thing in aluminum foil. And it looks kinda sus. But after that, we can add a thin layer of clay, except for the bottom since no one will ever see it, and this will allow us to add all the greenery later in the build. Putting aside the base for now, I want to sculpt a very magical, very round, veneer-wearing, fluffy ball we know as Totoro. I'm gonna bulk out his general shape with foil until it looks like a mouse- oh, sorry, there's a pop-up. And then move on to defining his features with clay. Once I have a good general shape, I can add his adorable stumpy legs by making two discs of clay and blending them in with one of my tools. Not too long after that, we can add his arms and blend those in so he looks like Totoro and not another similarly spherical animated character. To add a little bit more definition to his face, I'm gonna add his snout mouth area, his... his mouth, and blend that into his face. Once we have his base all shaped, I can add the separation between his gray fur and beige fur with a carved line across his stomach. With that line carved on, I can start adding his fur, which I actually had a lot of fun doing. I just used one of my silicone shapers and random, slightly wavy lines, trying to keep in mind what direction the fur would realistically fall. Before I start the fur on his face, I'm gonna add his facial features starting with his extremely adorable nose. I add a piece and shape it until his no face becomes a nose face, and then I add his tiny nostrils with one of my tools. Next I can carve in his sleepy closed eyes, his mouth, and his three little freckles on each side of it. These little holes are not where his whiskers are gonna go, as you can see he just kinda has these cute freckles. So I'm punching them in now so I can remember later and make sure that they don't get lost in all his fur. Now I can add some wires to his head to support his ears and ensure that they don't just break off at random. Luckily, his ears are very simple. Just a thin ring of clay on the bottom and a thicker triangle of clay on top. With all that done, we can go back and add the rest of his fur, again making sure that it goes the proper direction. Since we can now add the fur around the more delicate areas such as his eyes, nose, and mouth, I'm switching tools to add more frequent, thinner lines to those areas since that's how fur works. With the fur done everywhere except for his belly, I'm going to define his eyes and mouth a little bit more by adding thin rolls of clay on top. This will be easier to paint later on and help them be a bit more discernible amongst all that fur. Finally, we can add his glorious belly fur and the gray markings that sit on top of it. I shaped them until they look sufficiently arrow-like and then I made them furry. When I was adding the fur texture to the markings, I made sure to texture it in a different way so it would be kind of easier to see since, as I said before, this guy's got a lot of hair. I stuck in his three whiskers on each side, and then I stuck in his claws, which are just little needles of clay that I pre-baked so I could attach them easily. Our huggable fur loaf is all done now, so we can finally add little May sleeping on him. I'm pretty bad at sculpting humans, so her position will be exactly the same as it is right here, only with her head facing in the opposite direction. Why did I make this change, you ask? I 
I pick option C, but anyway. I'm starting by making a rough form of arms and legs, shaped to lay flat against Totoro's fluffy belly, which I can then layer her clothing on top of. I start with her white undershorts before cutting out her dress and laying it over top. Once the dress is secured, I attach the white puffy sleeves that it's connected to. Then I can roll out a thin piece of clay to add the little hem connecting her sleeves to her arms. Now I might be taking some pompous artistic liberty here, but I decided to give the hems ruffles because I just think it's so damn cute. Next we can give this tiny child some tiny shoes. I'm adding a lip to the shoes because this small piece is a marginally darker yellow, so this will make it easier to paint. Once she has some sweet kicks, it's time to give her a head. All I did was take a ball of clay and shaped it ever so slightly so I could just carve in the details. I made a line separating her face from her hair, and then I added her pigtails, her hair accessories, and her hair texture. With her head all done, I can give her some Nintendo 64 era hands before moving on to give her a tiny little bag. I add the strap connecting it to her neckline and connect the strap properly to the back of the bag. Nobody will ever see this, but I can at least appreciate the effort. Moving on, it's time to add the lifeblood that makes Ghibli films unique, nature. This part was definitely the most time consuming because we have a lot of area to fill as we're doing both the front and the back for an entirely 3D diorama, but I started out by framing a few choice areas with grass. To make this grass, I cut out thin strips of clay, scored it with a needle before folding it up randomly and attaching it. I repeated this process with all the grassy areas, but I didn't do them entirely in order, so in between I do the bulk of the greenery, which is the moss. To achieve a mossy look deserving of the Ghibli title, I'm pressing a million billion holes into the fresh clay. This part will not look good if you do any less than a million billion holes. But once we have those in, I can start adding bigger foliage like hanging grass, ivy, tree branches, and mushrooms. I did the inside of the piece first because I knew I'd be using the outside of the model to hold on to, but now that the inside is done, we can make the outside just as special. I'm basically repeating the same exact process, only I'm trying to keep in mind that I'll be moving this and using my hands to grab onto it from this side. Because of this, I want the foliage and other natural accessories to lay pretty flush against the back with ample room for my hands to move it around. As a result, the back is made mostly of moss, but it's accompanied by big flat leaves, branches adorned with mushrooms, and a couple small patches of grass. To add more diversity to the moss, and so it doesn't look like I just shoved my craft into a carpet, I'm adding clumps of clay that'll texture in the same way as the moss so it looks more natural. This is what it looks like with everything added, but because the entire model is white, it's a bit tough to see the detail, so let's add a base coat of green. And with the base coat of green on, we can finally add varying layers of lighter greens and other natural colors that will turn this piece into at least half as dimensional as Studio Ghibli art. I tried to keep in mind where the sun would be hitting the model, so on the corners of the entrance, the tips of the grass, and on the top of the moss clumps are where I tried to add the lightest highlights. Once the dry brushing was done for the greenery, I painted the tree trunks and gave those a dry brushing as well. I 
I painted the different types of leaves darker and lighter green so everything wouldn't blend together completely and I gave them their own set of highlights. Then I painted all the mushrooms a light beige, which if you enjoy watching me paint these mushrooms, I'd venture to say you'll go buck wild for me painting the many more mushrooms on my Breath of the Wild horse god statue. I'll add a card at the top to watch that video if you're interested, but for now let's finish up these mushrooms so we can move on to painting Totoro and Mei. I'm going to start with Mei by painting her arms and legs first, then painting her undershorts and giving her dress a nice coat of pink. Then we can color her Yeezy's yellow before coloring the lip of her shoes a marginally darker yellow. I added a twinge of orange to the color of her shoes to paint the strap around her neck along with the bag before moving on to her hair and hair accessories. May didn't take long because she's so tiny and now we can move- That's too dark. Now we can move on to Totoro. I'm painting his head, ears, and all the fur around his belly a nice Totoro gray. Then I'm going to color his belly fur in a light beige before going back in the same Totoro gray to color his markings. I'm giving him the slightest dry brush of a lighter gray just to make a bit of the fur pop and moving on to his facial features. I color his wire whiskers a black and follow suit with the same color for his eyes and his nose. I'm adding a thin layer of UV resin to his entire nose to make it look a bit less flat and more like an actual animal nose. After I paint his eyes, our journey to sculpt this fluffy forest spirit has finally come to a close. In all his glory, here he is. goodness thank you so much for watching all the way to the end you're an absolute legend if you enjoyed the video give it a like subscribe to the channel and comment down below what other studio ghibli crafts you'd like to see i love studio ghibli with all my dead heart so this craft was an absolute joy and i hope you can see the love that went into it all right i'll see you next time